And the chair now recognizes herself for an opening statement. Today, American consumers are under constant assault. As quickly and quietly as a wallet can be stolen by a skilled pickpocket, your personal identity can be hijacked without you knowing it by online hackers. The Federal Trade Commission estimates that nearly 9 million Americans fall victim to identity theft every year, costing consumers and businesses billions of dollars annually, and those no numbers are growing steadily and alarmingly. In recent years, sophisticated and carefully orchestrated cyber attacks designed to obtain personal information about consumers, especially when it comes to their credit cards, have become one of the fastest growing criminal enterprises here in the U.S. and across the world. The boldness of these attacks and the threat that they present to unsuspecting Americans was underscored recently by, the, by massive data breaches at Epsilon and Sony. With 77 million accounts stolen, including some 10 million credit card numbers, the data breach involving Sony's PlayStation Network has the, the potential to become the great Brinks robbery of cyber attacks, and the take just keeps going up. While the FBI and the Secret Service, along with other law enforcement agencies, work around the clock to try and crack the sensational case, we now learn that a second Sony online service was also compromised during the same time period. Computer, uh, computer hackers obtained access to personal information relating to an additional 25 million uh, customer accounts. That's more than 100 million accounts now in jeopardy. Like their customers, both Sony and Epsilon are victims too, but they also must shoulder some of the responsibility for these stunning thefts, which shake the confidence of everyone who types in a credit card number and simply hits enter. E-commerce is a vital and growing part of our economy. We should take, ste take steps to embrace and protect it, and that starts with robust cybersecurity. As chairman of this subcommittee, I'm deeply troubled by these latest data breaches and the decision by both Epsilon and Sony not to testify today. This is unacceptable. According to Epsilon, the company did not have time to prepare for our hearing, even though its data breach occurred more than a month ago. Sony, meanwhile, says it was too busy with its ongoing investigation to appear. Well, what about the millions of American consumers who are still twisting in the wind because of these breaches? They deserve some straight answers, and I'm determined to get them. For instance, how do these breaches occur? What steps are being taken to prevent future breaches? And what's being done to mitigate the effects of these breaches on American consumers? Yet for me, the single most important question is simply this. Why weren't Sony's customers notified sooner of the cyber attack? I fundamentally believe that all consumers have a right to know when their personal information has been compromised, and Sony, as well as all other companies, have an overriding responsibility to promptly alert them. In Sony's case, company official officials first revealed information about the data breach on their blog. That's right, a blog. I hate to pile on, but in essence, Sony put the burden on consumers to search for information instead of accepting the burden of notifying them. If I have anything to do with that kind of half-hearted, half-baked response is not going to fly in the future. This ongoing mess only reinforces my long-held belief that much more needs to be done to protect sensitive consumer information. Americans need additional safeguards to prevent identity theft, and I will soon introduce legislation designed to accomplish this goal. My legislation will be crafted around a guiding principle. Consumers should be promptly informed when their personal information has been jeopardized. Clearly, as I've said, cyber attacks are on the rise. According to the Privacy Rights Clearinghouse, over 2,500 data breaches involving some 600 million records have been made public since 2005. In fact, last month alone, some 30 data breaches at hospitals, insurance companies, universities, banks, airlines, and governmental agencies impacted nearly 100 million records. And that's in addition to the massive breaches at Epsilon and Sony. The time has come for Congress to take decisive action. We need a universal national standard for data security and data breach notification, and we need it now. While I remain hopeful that law enforcement officials will quickly, quickly determine the extent of these latest cyber attacks, they serve as a reminder, as well as a wake-up wake up call, that all companies have a responsibility to protect personal information and to promptly notify customers when that information has been put at risk. We have a responsibility as lawmakers to make certain that this happens. And now I'd like to recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Butterfield, for five minutes for an opening statement. Let me thank the chairman for convening this important hearing today, and particularly thank the witnesses for coming forward with your testimony. Uh, before giving my opening statement, I would uh, yield uh, such time as he may consume to the former chairman of this committee, of the full committee, and now the ranking member, the gentleman from California. Thank you very much, Mr. Butterfield. I appreciate your uh, courtesy in 
allowing me to go ahead of you with an opening statement. I must go to another uh, committee that's meeting at the same time. I would like to thank uh, Chairman uh, Bono Mack for holding this timely and important uh, hearing. In the last month, we've seen some serious private sector data breaches that have affected millions of Americans. Just last week, Sony revealed that it, it revealed that information connected to 77 million customer accounts had been compromised. And then on Monday, Sony announced that even more consumer information was breached. Data breaches threaten the financial well-being of individuals whose personal information is exploited to commit identity theft or fraud. There is no one solution to these threats. Criminal hackers are targeting us every minute. Today we'll hear from federal law enforcement and how they are attacking this problem. However, the private sector also must step up to the plate. The private sector can and must do a better job of safeguarding sensitive personal information. Information is the currency of the digital economy and it must be secured. Just as a bank would not leave its vault unlocked and open to thieves, companies must secure information and keep it out of the hands of identity thieves and other criminals. And when personal information is compromised, companies have an obligation to inform those individuals whose information was lost or stolen so that they can take steps to detect and prevent ident identity theft or other harm. I'm hopeful that this committee can again, uh, in a bipartisan fashion, pass the Data Accountability and Trust Act and work as a team to get the Senate to follow suit. The data bill, as passed by the House last Congress, creates two major security requirements. One, an entity holding data containing personal information must adopt reasonable and appropriate security measures to protect such data. And two, that same entity must notify affected consumers in the event of breach unless the entity determines there is no reasonable risk of identity theft, fraud, or other unlawful conduct. I look forward to uh, today's hearing and working together to quickly repass the Data Accountability and Trust Act. I yield back the uh, balance of Let me thank you, Mr. Waxman, for your leadership uh, on this issue and, and your leadership on this committee. Uh, in preparing for this hearing today, I, I was told by my staff that well over 100 million consumer records have been compromised as a result of breaches at Epsilon Data Management and Email Marketer and at Sony's PlayStation and online entertainment networks. Uh, if that is indeed a fact, this is very, very alarming. And so this hearing today is certainly very important. Uh, I uh, want you to know, uh, Madam Chairman, that I stand ready to work with you and our colleagues uh, to pass strong bipartisan data security legislation like the data bill uh, that will prevent this uh, from reoccurring. Uh, I ask unanimous consent that my full statement be included in the record. I yield back. I thank the gentleman at the chair. Uh, recognizes Mr. Stearns from Florida for three minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And let me uh, also uh, compliment you on having this hearing. Uh, I share your disappointment that Epsilon and Sony have not shown up. Uh, obviously, they could uh, uh, provide us a lot of information that perhaps some of our witnesses could not. And I think it uh, ultimately is their responsibility to explain it. Uh, Madam Chair, as Chair chairman of the Oversight and Investigation Committee, uh, I certainly would want to work with you uh, to find out uh, perhaps uh, what really happened and perhaps to extend uh, a hearing on this on my subcommittee. And let me also say to you, this is a, an issue that in the 109th Congress, when I was chair of this subcommittee, uh, I had a bill, a data security bill, uh, and this bill uh, was H.R. 4127. It passed out of the subcommittee bipartisan support. It passed out of the full committee, uh, bipartisan support. Uh, it did not pass the House, unfortunately. And so uh, with your leadership, perhaps we can get this through the House. Uh, so I'm very anxious to support you and help you in your endeavors to at actually get a bill through the House and to the Senate. Uh, this is so important. If the data security bill that I had in the 109th Congress uh, had actually passed, which required entities that hold personal information to establish and maintain appropriate security policies to prevent unauthorized acquisition of that data. 
So companies would have a data security officer, and that officer would have the mandate and the requirement to protect uh, the information. Um, it, it was interesting that the issue is so uh, important that bipartisan support in the 109th Congress uh, was available. So surely I would think we could get bipartisan support again. Uh, I know Mr. Rush, when he was chairman, he took the bill that we had uh, and he offered it again and I uh, co-sponsored that bill with him and now uh, with a new majority and you, uh, Madam Chair, in, in the uh, chairwoman, I think this is a, a really a very important issue for you and this subcommittee to make a stand, get the bill through the subcommittee, through the full committee and uh, try and get it through the, the, uh, the House. Uh, I think a lot of people are just staggered by what has happened and uh, if we should not delay, I think this hearing is important. I look forward to uh, participating and also hearing their comments. Um, but in the end, I think both parties agree that this is uh, something that should be uh, answered with, with a bill that's substantive and bring in the uh, jurisdiction of the Federal Trade Commission and others to help us out. So thank you. I yield back. I thank the gentleman and, and would like to say that we have one panel of witnesses joining us today. Each of our witnesses has prepared an opening statement that will be placed into the record. Each of you will be given five minutes to summarize the statement with your remarks. On our panel, we have uh, David Vladek, Director of the Bureau of Consumer Protection at the Federal Trade Commission. Also testifying, we have Pablo Martinez, uh, Deputy Special Agent in charge of the Criminal Investigative Unit for the U.S. Secret Service. We have Dr. Jean Spafford, Professor and Executive Director from Purdue University, Center for Education and Research in Information, Assurance and Security. And last but not least, we have Justin Bruffman, Director of the Consumer Privacy Product Project at Center for Democracy and Technology. Good morning to each of you, and we welcome you. We're very grateful that you're here with us this morning. And uh, if you can keep track of the time by the time clocks uh, that are on the table, I'm assuming. Staff? Oh, that's a new improvement. Technology. Okay. Well, green, yellow, and red, much like a stoplight. If you could keep your eye on it, we'd appreciate it. And Mr. Uh, Vladek, uh, we recognize you for your first five minutes, or five minutes. Uh, good morning. Uh, Chairman Bono Mack, Ranking Member Butterfield, and members of the subcommittee. I am David Vladek, Director of the Federal Trade Commission's Bureau of Consumer Protection. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to present testimony here this morning. The written statement is su submitted on behalf of the Commission. This statement and my responses to questions represent my views. As the nation's consumer protection agency, the FTC is committed to protecting consumer privacy and promoting data security in the private sector. We all know that data security is critically important to consumers. If companies do not safeguard the personal information they collect and store, that information could fall into the wrong hands, resulting in fraud and other harm to consumers. And as more and more breaches take place, there is a risk that consumers could lose confidence in the marketplace. As the Commission's testimony makes clear, the Commission unanimously supports legislation that would require companies to implement reasonable security policies and procedures. The Commission also supports legislation that would require companies to notify consumers in appropriate circumstances when there is a security breach so that consumers can take steps to protect themselves. By enacting legislation, Congress would also send a clear message that all companies that hold consumer information, including common carriers and nonprofit organizations, must take responsible and appropriate measures to safeguard that information and must notify consumers if their information has been expo exposed in a breach. A data security statute would establish the standards that companies must adhere to, and by empowering the Federal Trade Commission to seek civil penalties for violations would deter, would deter poor security practices. These statutory provisions would reduce the incidence of identity theft and other financial harms, saving consumers from the hardships that ensue when there is a breach. The Commission's testimony also describes our efforts to promote data security, which focuses on three activities. Enforcement cases against companies that fail to provide adequate security, education for consumers and businesses, and policy initiatives to promote better data security. 
Enforcement. We've brought more than 30 law enforcement actions against businesses that fail to protect consumers' personal information, including two actions we announced just yesterday. In the first case, Ceridian, a large payroll processing company that maintains highly sensitive payroll information, failed to take reasonable measures to prevent an intruder from hacking into Ceridian's payroll processing system. The hacker compromised personal information, including social security numbers and financial account information, of approximately 28,000 employees of Ceridian small business customers. In the second case, Lookout Services, a company offering a web-based application to assist employers in verifying their employees' eligibility to work in the United States, had weak, authentic, authentic, uh, authentic, uh, weak practices in web application vulnerabilities. As a result, an employee of a Lookout customer was, uh, was able to gain unauthorized access to Lookout's entire customer database, which include highly sensitive information including social security numbers, dates of birth, passport numbers, alien registration numbers, driver's licenses, military identification numbers, and so forth. The orders entered in both cases require the companies to implement comprehensive data security programs and obtain independent audits for 20 years. Orders of this kind are standard in our data breach cases, and I underscore we are not authorized to seek civil penalties in these cases, so we rely on injunctive relief. The Commission also pro promotes data security practices through extensive use in consumer and business education. For example, our websites designed to educate consumers about basic security, uh, co computer cons uh, security have recorded more than 14 million unique visits, and our business education touches on a wide range of issues from P2P file sharing, which I know is of particular interest to the chair, and to copier data security. Uh, we also engage in policy actions. We published a staff report in December proposing a new fr framework for privacy, which calls on companies to build privacy and data security into the design of goods and services, to maintain reasonable safeguards for consumer data, to limit the data they collect, to retain data for only so long as they have a legitimate business need to do so. Uh, in closing, we thank the chair for holding this important hearing, and we look forward to working with you and your colleagues on data security. Of course, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Vladek. Uh, Mr. Martinez, you're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Madam Chair. Welcome, everybody. And would you please, um, excuse me, but turn on your microphone. I think we got it now. Good morning, Madam Chair, Ranking Member Butterfield, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the role of the Secret Service in cyber investigations. In February 2010, the Department of Homeland Security delivered the Quadrennial Homeland Security Review, which established a framework for homeland security missions and goals and underscored the need for a safe and secure cyberspace. As a vital component of DHS, we work to support the Department's mission to safeguard cyberspace. Through greater understanding of how the criminal world operates, the Secret Service has developed strategies that have a tremendous impact in terms of disrupting and dismantling underground networks. We use this knowledge of criminal networks to adapt our response to the challenges posed by financial crimes in the 21st century. Breaking up these criminal networks requires a highly coordinated law enforcement approach focused on constant innovation and tactics to meet these emerging threats. The Secret Service continually develops the technical expertise to track down and successfully infiltrate, infiltrate, investigate, and prosecute with our partners cyber criminals who pride themselves on their knowledge and technical prowess. In many cases, law enforcement has learned the tricks and techniques that cyber criminals use to hide their identities and their crimes and in turn develop countermeasures that allow the perpetrators to be apprehended and prosecuted. A central component of our approach is the training provided through our Electronic Crime Special Agent Program, which gives our special agents the tools they need to conduct computer forensic examinations on electronic evidence obtained from computers, personal data assistance, and other electronic devices. To date, more than 1,400 special agents are except trained. In fact, the Secret Service values this training so highly that the basic level is now incorporated as a part of the curriculum that all special agent trainees receive at our James J. Rowley Training Center. 
The training we provide, however, extends past our own agents to others in the public sector. To further address cybercrime, we continue to train state and local law enforcement through our National Computer Forensic Institute initiative. Since 2008, the Secret Service has provided training to 932 state and local law enforcement officials, prosecutors, and judges. The Secret Service's commitment to sharing information and best practices is perhaps best reflected through the work of our 31 electronic crime task forces, two of which are located overseas in Rome, Italy, and London, England. Our domestic and foreign partners benefit from the resources, information, expertise, and advanced research provided by our, our international network of members. The Secret Service continues to undertake complex cases that require a large investment of time and actively targets individuals who take part in criminal activities regardless of where they are physically located. To coordinate these investigations at the headquarters level, the Secret Service has enhanced our cyber intelligence section to identify transnational cyber criminals involved in network intrusions, identity theft, credit card fraud, bank fraud, and other computer-related crimes. In the past two years, CIS has directly contributed to the arrest of 41 transnational cyber criminals who were responsible for the largest network intrusion cases ever prosecuted in the, in the United States. These intrusions resulted in the theft of hundreds of millions of credit card numbers and a financial loss of approximately $600 million to financial and retail institutions. These cases are complicated and directly impact the lives of millions of American citizens. At all levels, law enforcement is also having some success in getting the legal system to recognize the seriousness of losses stemming from online financial crime. And this fact is reflected in the lengths of some of the prison sentences levied against these defendants. As a result of the Secret Service's successful investigation into the network intrusion of Heartland payment systems, which I described in more detail in my written remarks, the three suspects in the case were indicted for various computer-related crimes. The lead defendant in the indictment pled guilty and was sentenced to 20 years in federal prison. There is little doubt that the possibility of serving 20 years in prison will provide a much greater deterrent than did the sentences typically seen in such, ca such cases a decade ago. Madam Chair, Ranking Member Butterfield, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, the Secret Service is committed to our mission of safeguarding the nation's cyber infrastructure and will continue to aggressively investigate cyber and computer-related crimes to protect American consumers and institutions from harm. This concludes my prepared statement. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify on behalf of the Secret Service. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. Dr. Stafford, you're recognized for five minutes. Madam Chair, fellow Ranking Member Butterfield, uh, members of the committee, uh, I've been working in the field of uh, information security for about 30 years, and uh, I'm speaking with that background, and also as chairman of uh, USACM, which is the Public Policy Council of the ACM, uh, which is the uh, world's largest educational and scientific computing society. And uh, we have uh, a number of members who work in security, privacy, and uh, electronic data. So we have a great deal of expertise in this in this uh, arena. And our knowledge of this is that this is a very significant problem. We have seen this as a growing uh, area of concern over a uh, number of decades. And certainly the data that has been presented, what you've heard, what you've seen, indicates that the problem is getting worse. It is not only a national problem, but as Mr. Martin has just said, uh, an international problem. Uh, we'd like to point out that it is a problem not only for private firms, but also for government agencies. Uh, there is data that is held by government agencies uh, in databases, and some of it is privileged information because government is in a position to collect particularly sensitive data, and that is often uh, compromised and released. Uh, the Privacy Rights Clearinghouse maintains a database uh, where they track various forms of data breaches and releases, and uh, according to their figures, it's averaged approximately 100 million records per year for the last six years running have been released. Interestingly, the Sony breach breaches this year have totaled 100 million all on their own. So we're well ahead of that record just based on those releases by themselves. If we combine that with a study that was done by the Ponemon Institute that indicates that for companies having these breaches, uh, they cost approximately $214 per record to clean up after the breaches, we come up with a figure of $21 billion per year in cost to clean up after the breaches, on average, 
And those costs are being passed on to the consumers. Along with that, we then have all of the costs for the various fraud, law, uh, law enforcement investigation, other kinds of losses piled onto that, and all of the losses for unreported breaches and other losses that are unreported. So it is possible that the losses to the American public and the American economy could be as high as $100 billion per year from these breaches. Uh, I'll note that there was a story in the New York Times today that some of the uh, credit card fraud underground bulletin board uh, uh, groups are worried that the massive loss of credit cards from uh, the Sony breach may be depressing the price, the underground uh, price for credit cards by a factor of five or ten because it will reduce the cost of the black market uh, uh, trading price of uh, credit card numbers. So perhaps there is uh, some good to be had from the, uh, uh, the Sony breach. Uh, looking at the problem uh, realistically, <coughs> disclosure uh, uh, notification laws help at some level after the fact uh, because it does help uh, victims take some action to, pr to protect their identity and to protect against some of their information being used illegally. However, it does not solve all of the problem. Uh, law enforcement has made some uh, gains, but they are not adequately resourced. We certainly do not have uh, enough in the way of forensic tools. There's uh, more need for research there, and there certainly is uh, a need for more law enforcement uh, agents and resources for prosecution. But more importantly, there are the preventive aspects. Uh, we don't have enough in the way of um, requirements on companies to take the preventative measures to prevent the kinds of disclosures that are occurring. In large part, that's because security is not viewed as something that returns a value. It's not something that adds to the bottom line. It takes away from the bottom line. Companies don't like to invest in security. They don't understand the risk involved by not investing in security. And those that do understand some of the risk in tight economic times are willing to play the risk. Uh, they believe they may not be hit by the problem. So when they are and they have to pay the cost, they pass that along to their customers and to the rest of society. That's where all of this uh, large expense comes from. So. Among the recommendations we have uh, are, first of all, minimize the amount of data that's kept by these companies. Uh, second, age the data. They shouldn't keep the data any longer than they absolutely need to. Many companies keep a great deal of data simply because they think it might be useful someday. Uh, they should have sound security practices in place, and there are a number that are known that companies don't apply. Uh, we urge you to make sure that government databases are covered equally uh, the same as private databases in any regulation so that all are covered by any uh, appropriate uh, uh, regulation. And there are a number of others that are in my written testimony. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions, and uh, USACM and our experts would be happy to help you in any way. Thank you, Dr. Stafford. Uh, Mr. Brookman, you're recognized for your five minutes. <coughs> Would you, um, uh, is your microphone on? Is it on now? Is it on? Hello? Yeah. There you go. Thank you. Just a little closer. It helps. Uh, CDT is extremely pleased to see that the subcommittee is placing such a high priority on uh, protecting consumers' personal information in an increasingly complex data economy. Uh, and we very much appreciate the chair's leadership in this area. Data security breaches are sadly nothing new for most consumers, but as more and more industry players get access to more and more consumer data and storage costs continue to get lower and lower, consumers, uh, it's clear, are increasingly at risk for uh, loss of their personal data. Now, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, strong law already does exist to require companies to in, uh, put into place reasonable security measures and to notify consumers in the event of a breach. Uh, the FCC, as, as Director Blatt explained, uh, has applied its unfairness of authority to require companies to adopt reasonable security measures, uh, not just for financial information, but for non-financial informa information as well. Uh, and a considerable majority of states uh, require notification to consumers in the event of a breach that could result in a monetary loss. Uh, I understand the subcommittee is considering a legislative solution in order to address uh, the issues of data security and data breach. From, from our perspective and from a consumer perspective, 
Uh, we believe that uh, federal legislation should not merely replicate the existing protections that are out there for consumers, uh, but should, significant, should be significantly strengthened to offer greater protections. Uh, for example, the FTC's authority to get uh, 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 to enforce against poor data security practices uh, could be put specifically into law to be more clear, um, but they would be stronger if the FTC were given uh, greater resources to go to bring uh, more cases. Uh, and the ability to get civil penalties for uh, persons who violate Section 5 of the FTC Act. Uh, similarly, we believe uh, that uh, data breach notification laws would be improved uh, if they were to enact the full range of full of the fair information practice principles, not merely security and notification after the fact. Uh, as an initial matter, uh, when considering uh, legislative solutions, our first uh, uh, advice would be do no harm. While it is clear that the existing uh, legal framework is, is insufficient to protect consumers, uh, they do offer strong protections without which we think consumers would be worse off. CDT uh, has testified previously positively about the, uh, the, the Data Act uh, referenced by Representative Stern. Um, we did so because we believed it was a strong bill and with some minor uh, revisions could be as strong as the best state laws, but it also offered consumers something they didn't already have, uh, which is uh, the rights of access to uh, uh, data stored about them by data brokers. Uh, so we thought it would be a, a net positive for consumers. Um, we believe also that, that whatever law is passed should allow states to continue to innovate and to bring uh, to pass new consumer protections for consumers. I think it's important to remember that it was in the laboratories of the states that the idea of data breach notification uh, came up uh, because of the, the relatively narrow, precise preemption language in Graham Leach Wiley. Uh, and CDT would be skeptical of any law that prohibited uh, similar state innovations for consumer protection. But fundamentally, we believe that the most effective way to safeguard consumer data would be to uh, enact the, the compre comprehensive privacy protection legislation that implements the, the full range of fair information practice principles. Uh, these would not necessarily prevent uh, data breaches from occurring, but they would, I believe, significantly mitigate their effects. And, and one idea, one of these principles is the idea of data minimization. Companies should only collect that data they need to accomplish a specific purpose, uh, and they should get rid of it when it's no longer valuable. And I think it's fair to say, as, as Dr. Stafford pointed out, this is really honored in the breach today. Uh, companies uh, collect and retain data without notice to consumers uh, on the chance it may become valuable to them one day. Uh, one example from the recent data breach is, is I think, indicative. Uh, so Walgreens was hit by a data breach in, in, in 2010, uh, end of 2010 in December. Uh, they had to send notices not just to current uh, customers, but also folks who had previously unsubscribed from receiving their emails. And they didn't explain why they retained those email addresses in the first place. And then uh, just last month, as part of the Epsilon data breach, Walgreens was again hit by a data breach incident. Again, uh, previous customers who had previously unsubscribed had their uh, information uh, exposed to, to, uh, to hackers. Similarly, it was reported just last night that as part of the Sony online data breach incident, 10,000 credit card numbers were accessed from, quote, an outdated database going back to 2007. Uh, I guess the good news from that is that only 900 of those credit card numbers were still active, but it remains a legitimate question why those numbers were being stored in the first place. And I know as a result of the Epsilon data breach, I got notice from at least one company who I had not done business with in almost six years and who I'd, I'd have unsubscribed from as well. Uh, we believe that a, a comprehensive privacy law that requires reasonable data minimization, uh, that requires companies to actually tell consumers what they're doing with their data and give consumers meaningful choice uh, about how that data is shared and transferred would be the most effective policy means to limit the consequences of data security breaches. Uh, we look forward uh, to continuing to engage the members of the subcommittee uh, on appropriate legislative solutions. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Brooklyn. The chair now recognizes herself for five minutes for the first uh, round of question. And uh, I'd like to start with uh, Mr. Vladek. According to reports, Sony took nearly a week before notifying consumers or customers about the cyber attack. How long does a typical company uh, that has been subjected to a data breach need before it notifies its customers? And what is the average time that is necessary to make a determination and to inform consumers that their information may have been breached? We share the concern, I think, of everyone in this room that consumers need to be notified as promptly as possible. There are two practical exigencies that sometimes delay notification. One is there is a need that the company patch whatever hole there is in their system before the breach is, is, is made public. And second, it sometimes takes the company some time to understand what information has been accessed and, and who needs to be notified of the breach. We think this should happen as soon as practical. 
uh, and, and in the prior legislation, for example, there was an outer limit set at 60 days. I don't know whether that's the right date or not. Uh, I can't answer your question about common practices. Data breaches vary so much that it's hard to extract a general rule. The smaller the breach, uh, typically, the quicker the notification can go out. But in a massive breach where the company may still be trying to patch up its system if it's still operating, and Sony, the, 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 one of the systems was not, um, you do worry about uh, notification before the company has had an opportunity to, to plug the hole. Uh, but, but I think that we all would agree that consumers need to be notified as swiftly as possible so they can take action to protect themselves. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Martinez, uh, a, a couple of questions. Can you briefly explain to me the difference from why the FBI might be involved as opposed to, uh, to your agency? Yes. Um, uh, the, st the, statutory, the statute most, most used to prosecute cyber criminals is 18 U.S.C. 1030, which is a computer fraud statute. The Secret Service shares uh, concurrent jurisdiction with the FBI on, on those types of investigations. However, with uh, investigations that deal with national security or ter terrorism that are cyber related, the FBI is the lead agency in those efforts. Um, and through the NCIJTF, they lead the government or law enforcement's efforts in state-sponsored or, or national security type uh, investigations. We have a representative there. When it comes to criminal matters, it, it, we have concurrent jurisdiction. So it's a, a lot of times it depends on the relationship that either the uh, specific company might have with either law enforcement agency, whether it's through uh, a, a, some type of a working group or task force or cyber task force that, that where that company might reside. So for example, the Secret Service has 29 domestic electronic crime task forces. And one of the things we, uh, we ask our people to do is develop those relationships with these private sector companies so that that relationship is there prior to the incident happening. The last thing we want is for that, you know, sort of when the fire goes off, that's the first time you meet the fireman. We want, that, we want there to be a relationship. And there are a lot of things that we, both us and the FBI, do with private sector companies to try to develop those points of contact prior to an intrusion happening. As I understand it, though, you are involved with Epsilon, but not with Sony. Can you explain that to us briefly? Yes. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we can't comment on ongoing investigations. I can't comment on the Sony investigation because that's being led by the FBI. Um, all I can say uh, with regards to the Epsilon vis investigation, because it's still ongoing, is that they did not notify us early on in the investigation and have cooperated so far with the Secret Service in, the, in that investigation. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Spafford, uh, Excuse me, Doctor. Uh, can you speak a little bit to Mr. Vladek's answer about notification for consumers within? The, I think we're puzzled with the 60-day timeline, and to me, it seems reasonable that the consumer should know immediately that there's no greater protector of one's own identity than the person themselves. Can you speak a little bit to uh, the 60-day timeline? Well, after uh, an intrusion or a breach has occurred, uh, it's necessary to find out. It, it is. Let me pull it closer. Um, after an incident has occurred, uh, it is necessary to determine uh, what records have been accessed to determine who needs to be contacted and what information was possibly taken to, to be able to uh, uh, inform the individuals what information might be at risk and perhaps give them information as to how to protect that. Unfortunately, not every organization keeps the kinds of records that would allow them to determine that. Uh, it's also uh, often the case that when evidence has, has uh, uh, been found that um, some kind of incident has occurred, that doesn't necessarily tell them how long that incident has been ongoing. Uh, they just detect that it has happened, but they don't know how far back it goes. So they have to very often pull records. Uh, do some forensic investigation. It may take a while to determine how many people, how far back the records go, how much data it takes. And that is not something that can occur instantaneously. Okay, thank you. Excuse me, Doctor. I'm sorry to cut you off, but I've run out of time. Okay. So we'll come back to a second round of questions. And the Chair recognizes Mr. Butterfield for five minutes. Uh, thank the Chairman. Uh, in the last Congress, the House passed H.R. 2221, the Data Accountability and Trust Act. We all know that. Uh, this bipartisan bill has built up widespread support across Congress uh, for its goal of reducing the number of data breaches and providing new rights to individuals 
whose personal information is compromised when a breach occurs. First question to Mr. Vladek. Uh, sir, if H.R. Uh, 2221, if it's passed into law uh, and, and it gives the FTC new authority and responsibility, uh, can you talk for a minute about the limitations you are under now with regard to information security and how such a law, if enacted, can strengthen FTC's hand with regard to breaches? Uh, thank you. Yes, it would strengthen our hand in at least three ways. First, I think the key insight in the proposed legislation is that it would, for the first time, erect a national standard requiring businesses that hold sensitive personal information to take reasonable and rigorous safeguards to protect it. And so, for one thing, there would be a congressionally dictated standard by which we could judge the performance of companies that hold on to personal information. Second, there would be a national breach notification standard, which would encompass a broad range of companies who may not be subject to all state and other laws. It would cover a, a broader range of activities. And third, we would have civil penalty authority. At the moment, we can place companies that have, have failed to protect consumer information under order to ensure that they don't violate uh, consumer privacy again. But that doesn't, in, that doesn't involve general deterrence. It doesn't send a signal to other companies that they have to step up to the plate and protect consumer information. Thank you. Let me direct this to Mr. Brookman. Mr. Brookman, I agree with you that we need more front-end data security measures so that the need for breach notification actually diminishes. Your written testimony discusses support for 2221 uh, for that model and the need for the proper incentives for industry to take data security uh, seriously. Can you elaborate more for me? Are you suggesting that the incentive be fear of enforcement? Yeah, I think that's a very uh, important uh, incentive. I think it, in Dr. Safford's testimony, he talks about how companies just don't. Excuse me, Mr. Brooklyn, will you please speak I to apologize. the Thank you. Companies don't think about this uh, very, very seriously in, in advance. Uh, the FTC has somewhat on an ad hoc basis said that uh, their prohibition on unfair practices means that it is the case that companies must uh, exercise reasonable security. I'm not entirely sure how well that really has sunk into corporate America. Um, and, and even more recently, they have expanded the, their concept uh, of, of data security, not just to financial information, but to, to uh, in things like email addresses instead. And that was uh, in their, what I think was a very strong and important settlement with the Twitter case. Uh, I would like to see uh, HR 2221, uh, or however, whatever it looks like in, in the next iteration, uh, to expand their concept of personal information, not just to financial information, but to other uh, uh, potentially personal information as well, such as email addresses, or else things like the, the, the Epsilon breach actually wouldn't even be affected by it. Companies should have to have reasonable security measures in place to do that. I think the FTC is getting there. I think with uh, sporadic enforcement, just merely because of limited resources, uh, it's not entirely clear to, I think, the rest of the world that is, in fact, the law. Um, putting it into law, I think, would be uh, an important thing, especially with the threat of civil penalties behind it to, to give it uh, some time. Well, let, let, let me ask you this. How do we ensure that a company is holding on to uh, personal data, data as long as necessary? Each company has different needs. How, how can we measure yeah, it's, that? Yeah, it's a very yeah. tricky issue, and, and, and this is one of the, I think, criticisms of the, of the Boucher Stearns privacy bill that, that came, uh, draft uh, privacy bill that la came out last year. And it, it prescribed a, a hard 180 day or maybe an 18 month cap on, on holding all personal data. And some companies were like, well, that makes sense for us. Maybe, maybe behavioral advertising, that's a good idea. Data brokers, maybe not, right? Maybe sure. we need to maintain the data for longer. Right. So we have supported a, a safe harbor model for, for legislation right. uh, such that uh, companies who have similar uh, business interests can get together and propose for our industry hey, let's all um, agree to hold on to data for 180 days, six months. A couple weeks, uh, depending on, on, on the scenario, so they don't feel at a competitive disadvantage to hold on to data just because their competitors might be doing the same. Right. Let, let me go back to the other end. One of our Hill newspapers, CQ Today, uh, reported earlier this week that the White House proposal on cybersecurity will be circulated later this month. The article explains that it calls for a federal standard for notification about data breaches and a str stronger role for the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, Special Agent Martinez, what role would the Secret Service have, if you know, and what other agencies at the uh, at DHS would would have a role? Sir, the uh, the Secret Service, along with other executive agencies, has been working uh, with the the administration on a comprehensive uh, uh, cybersecurity legislation, and specifically in the in the area of data breach. I think a couple things that 
that that data that that legislation needs to have is notice to consumers but also notice to, uh, to, to the government so that we can take appropriate actions and also some type of safe harbor provision for companies that, that are adhering to, to, the, to the right practices. In addition to the enforcement part, which would be handled by the Secret Service as part of the Department of Homeland Security, the National, the National Protection and Programs Directorate of DHS, where U.S. CERT and the NCIC and some of the other cyber entities uh, sit, like the National Cyber Security Division, they would also be involved in cyber intrusions in part with respects to the At five seconds left, Roddick, what role uh, would, would uh, FTC have, if you know? Well, we would hope we'd have uh, authority to enforce data breaches as we currently do, uh, to enforce failures to inform consumers properly of data breaches, uh, and we would, uh, we would hope we'd get civil penalty authority in that case. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I yield back. Thank the gentleman, and the chair recognizes uh, the Vice Chair of the Subcommittee, Ms. Blackburn, for five minutes. Thank you, and thank you all for being here. I appreciate that we're having this hearing today. I think one of the things we can all agree on is that giving consumers the tools that are necessary to protect their virtual you, if you will, their virtual online presence is going to be an imperative. Mr. Brookman, you just spoke to this uh, in, in your brief comments. I uh, want to go to Dr. Spafford, if I could. I appreciate that you start with recommendations to us and basically summarize these. I think that the thing that is uh, cons of concern to me is when it comes to notification, it basically looks as if what is happening is a culture of damage control by not doing these expediently. And I think we all realize that the technology is there for almost instant notification and uh, allowing individuals to know. Now, I'm one of those that would prefer to see the industry move forward with some best practices and some standards on how to deal with not only the data security issue, but also the privacy issue. And whether you're looking at the Epsilon case or the Sony case, or the Android apps, the Skype case uh, this week, what we see is um, an intrusion and an invasion into an individual's privacy because of a breach that has taken place in a relationship that they have. Uh, Dr. Spafford, moving to your um, recommendations on page 16 of your presentation, basically what you're saying is minimize the data, age the data, provide anonymity to uh, the consumer, and um, then you get down to talking about consent. Let's move to that and talk about that for just a second. When you have consumer consent, should you also allow a consumer a, an eraser switch so that if the company does not eliminate the data, then the consumer has the ability to go in and say, you know, whether it is 90 days or 180 days, that they can uh, remove their data. Where is that a recommendation that you all would consider workable or plausible? Uh, it depends upon the organization. Um, there are uh, some circumstances where the information may need to be kept uh, and the user may not be able to remove it because of there may be other reasons, for health reasons, for instance, or there may be contractual reasons that it really needs to be kept. But that certainly could be something that, uh, for commercial reasons, marketing reasons, the user may, uh, uh, may have that right or should have that right to have that removed. Okay. All right. Um, Mr. Martinez, I, we have we continue to talk about companies being breached. And I find it so interesting that we don't talk as much about penalties for the hackers and those that are actually the cyber snoops and committing these crimes. And it seems like that is what gets moved to the bottom of the conversation. And I would like to, um, for you just to talk a little bit about that. You've mentioned the computer fraud statute but it seems as if the perpetrators of the crimes, the hackers themselves, is where we should put more of our emphasis. 
Thank you. Um, in, in recent years, we've really seen an increase in the amount of uh, sentencing that these hackers are getting. For example, in the TJ or the Heartland Payment Systems case, TJX, we saw a sentence of 20 years for that individual. Recently, in another case that we recently did, uh, an individual was sentenced to 25 years. We believe these actions are having a deterrent factor, and, and one of the reasons we believe so, for the last two years, we've collaborated with Verizon Business on the data breach investigative report that talks about not only data breaches investigated by the Secret Service, but also those that Verizon uh, businesses responded to. And one of the things we've seen, and it's mentioned in the study, is, is that we are now seeing these, these criminals, and in the past they had always attacked financial services type companies because of the large volume of, of financial information they had, like processors and financial institutions. What we see now as, as the main targets is the hospitality and the retail industry, and we, and we believe the reason for that is because of the, of the uh, deterrent factor that some of these sentences are having. So for example, instead of trying to breach into a system that has 150 million financial accounts, they're going now after 10 or 12 smaller ones that have smaller amounts because of the because of the fact that they might face a higher sentence where they do be apprehended for the larger breach so we believe that these sentences have increased and are having some of some uh, some form of a deterrence okay I know I'm out of town uh, time I'll look forward to uh, a second round thank you gentle lady and the chair recognizes Ms. Schakowsky for five minutes thank you madam chairman um, Director Vladek, uh, you mentioned the need for a civil penalty authority to protect consumers. I am wondering if you've seen a, uh, a draft of a uh, civil penalty authority. There was discussion earlier, I think, um, uh, about the, the White House proposal on cybersecurity that is going to be circulated this month. Do you know if there's a, a draft of a civil penalty authority? I know there is a draft. I don't know how far along the drafting is, and I know that at least in, in that draft there is authority for us to assess civil penalties in the appropriate cases, yes. There is. A, and have you any expectation on when you might see that draft? None. Okay, so you've just heard that that includes? Uh, we, we have been shown a draft, and that draft did contain a civil per, uh, penalty provision. But so you have, have seen a draft? Yes, a draft. Yeah. That's, but the process my, is ongoing. I, we that don't was know. my question. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me also ask you, uh, any of you, this. I am a co-chair of a um, House Democratic Task Force on, uh, on seniors, senior citizens. And I'm particularly concerned about cyber criminal attempts to prey on older Americans. And I, I wonder if any of you could speak to that threat and to any efforts that are being made to protect particularly vulnerable people like seniors. If, if, if I may, uh, we've seen a spike in prize and sweepstakes scams aimed at senior citizens. I was in Chicago on Monday. One of your staff members was, was at our hearing um, and uh, it is quite clear that scammers are targeting the elderly, uh, defined as people over 60, which worries me a little. Um, but but t targeting that age. Are you taking it personally? Is I that am what it is? Very I personally. Okay. Um, targeting people of that age group for a particularly prize and sweet state scams. This is all uh, on the internet, and increasingly there's a phishing element. They know something, there's a spear phishing element. They know something about that person that makes the scam particularly appealing. Uh, we're working with our colleague organizations to do both public information and to, enforce, to do enforcement work in this area. Is it the scam itself that they're after? Or are they looking for the information about the individual? I mean, are they trying to get people to pay money to participate in a sweepstakes right. what happens, or, or well, both? Both. And what they often do is say you've won a million dollars, you just need to pay penalty, you just need to pay taxes or a customs fee in order to collect, and they'll often send a fake check uh, that is cashed, and then the, 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 the person who's been scammed sends or just typically wires money abroad. They never see, uh, obviously, their winnings. Uh, but they're out whatever uh, whatever the value of the check was. Thank you. Um, let me uh, finally ask a, a bit about um, Sony and the um, security breach, the uh, information breach there was. Um, Professor Staff Spafford, um, 
I know you don't have any specific knowledge about what Sony did or did not do to protect the personal information that are collected for consumers, but in your testimony you say, quote, some news reports indicate that Sony was running software that was badly out of date and had been warned about that risk, unquote. And I've seen some news reports about the Sony breach, and truthfully, I think uh, it seems like a lot of them come from uh, blogs and press releases from Sony. Um, so this is the first time I'm really hearing about the potentially outdated software and ignored warnings. Um, Sony was actually invited today, but declined to uh, appear, um, and Epsilon declined the subcommittee's invitation to testify as well. So I'm just wondering if you um, can discuss the problems with that, that software and um, any of the uh, information that led you to make that statement. On a few of the security mailing lists that uh, I read, there were discussions that uh, individuals who work in security and participate in the uh, Sony network had discovered uh, several months ago while they were examining the protocols on the Sony network um, to examine how the games worked. Uh, they had discovered that the uh, network servers were hosted on um, uh, Apache web servers, that's, that's a, a form of software, but they were running on very uh, old versions of Apache software uh, that were unpatched and uh, had no firewall installed. And so these were potentially vulnerable and that they had reported these in an open forum that was monitored by Sony employees uh, but had seen no response and no change or update to the software. And how long ago was that? That, that was two to three months prior to the uh, incident where the break-ins occurred. Thank you. I'll take the gentlelady, and the chair recognizes uh, Mr. Harper for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I certainly appreciate you holding this uh, very timely uh, uh, hearing on this topic, and, and I certainly appreciate the witnesses being here to give their insight. Uh, and Dr. Vladek, I, the first question I'd have for, for you is, you know, when you look at the, the expense that uh, many companies go to to try to put in a, uh, a system that is secure and works, uh, and let's say that it is, uh, how long can we say that it will remain secure as technology improves and changes? And, and with that, is there uh, a, a, a set time period that it would need to be updated, or is it just an as needed, and, and what, what do you recommend in that situation? Uh, we provide a lot of uh, advice to businesses on our website, and businesses use that, uh, those, those resources constantly, but our basic, our basic advice is inventory what you have, assess risks, don't collect information you don't need. For the information you do have, and this goes to Sony, protect against viruses, spyware, the, constantly be vigilant to make sure the patches you need to put in place are installed promptly, discard information when you're done, and put someone in charge. This is an ongoing dynamic process, and one of, I think, the key insights of the first piece of legislation, Mr. Stearns' legislation, was the need to start building an infrastructure to protect data. And, uh, you know, and, and that's an ongoing process. You can't, you know, check it every six months like you might do the oil in your car. This is something that you need to be vigilant about. Well, if, as you look at what uh, you're working on, how do you coordinate and keep in sync uh, with the, uh, all the state attorneys general on, on what they're trying to do and what you're trying to do? How do you coordinate that? Well, I, I think when there are data breaches, we generally take the lead on investigations. Many states have requirements that uh, consumers be notified, but they don't investigate and then take action when the breach was the result of, in our view, truly substandard uh, data security measures. Uh, but we do keep the states informed. We recently settled a case against LifeLock for data security violations as well as others. And in that case, we coordinated with 35 state attorneys general. Um, but in terms of the hardcore investigation, I think the key is that we take the lead on those. Okay, Mr. Martinez, on the, both the uh, Epsilon and, and Sony uh, matters, uh, I know you're limited on what you can tell us, but are you, can you tell us how long it took from the time the breach was detected until consumers were notified? Is that something you can share? 
Uh, I, I'm not sure. I'm, again, we didn't investigate the uh, Sony uh, in, um, in intrusion or not investigating. And on the Epsilon, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure what that information is. I can get back to you with that information. That'd be great. And listen, when we're looking at um, all of the breaches, you know, we, we certainly, the first thought we have is that it's going to be somebody who is, uh, you know, a criminal there for financial gain to access the account info, the personal info, or perhaps sell that data to someone. Uh, how much of it would you say is directly attributable to uh, uh, terrorist activity as opposed to what we consider the, the basic criminal? Unfortunately, sir, most of the, all those matters are handled by the FBI, so I, I think that would be a, a question better answered by them. And, and certainly I understand it goes to the FBI, but you know there's, there's the whole of all of the breaches, and so what percentage do you think comes to, to you and what percentage come, goes to the FBI? I mean, uh, that would be my, my question. With regards to criminal um, uh, in, uh, how, how much of it is, would you say, of the overall pie is related to uh, terrorist activity? Again, I couldn't speak to, to what percentage is related to terrorist activities. I believe there are a lot of the intrusions and a lot of the ones that this committee has, has been talking about today are criminal in nature. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Brookman, I know we're about uh, out of, of my time here, but, uh, you know, we talk about all – we certainly hear in the news what's been detected. You know, we know what, uh, what we learn, what uh, goes out in the press. Uh, what would you imagine? I know it's just uh, speculation, but what would you imagine goes undetected? Yeah, I mean, most of the state data breach laws really only require notification in the event of a chance of financial uh, uh, breach. Uh, and the states vary. Some of them, some of them say, uh, you know, notify unless you can pretty much prove uh, that there uh, nothing went wrong. Some of them require some thought that there might be harm. And, and if I lost my credit card, if I, a, a business, I lost all the credit card numbers, I would really have no reason to know those were used. Um, so I think those go undetected. Uh, I think a lot of the, the things like what happened with Epsilon, uh, because it is personal information, but it's not, but it's not financial information, um, there's no requirement for those companies to come out and say, hey, we lost your email address. Um, and to the, to the contrary, probably a pretty strong incentive not to do that. Thank you. Um, so I, I think, uh, yeah, there, there are a lot, I think, goes under the radar we don't know about. And uh, I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think, gentlemen, and the chair recognizes Mr. Stearns for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Valdick, uh, when I did the bill in the 109th Congress, I think there was probably less than 30 states that had passed data security legislation, and now there's 46, I'm told. What I'm curious, it, it would seem to me with almost the entire United States adopting, each state adopting legislation, wouldn't that be incentive enough for companies like Sony and Epsilon worrying about their reputation and the civil liability? I mean, why would this occur based upon 46 states already having legislation? Well, I think there are two reasons. One is the state laws do not do what you proposed, which is to require good underlying security. And to me, one of the key insights of your legislation was that we need to do that on a national basis. Congress needs to step in and say to people, hold to companies, holding on to sensitive consumer information, look, you need to take reasonable security measures. The second is, uh, and as the statistics today have, have sort of driven home, there are an awful lot of data breaches that have been made public. I'm not sure the reputational hit these companies take necessarily is strong enough general incentive to make them step up to the plate. Time and again, we investigate substantial companies, and we find very outdated, outmoded, and insecure practices. And so I think the proof is in the marketplace. Uh, there are still, uh, by my measure, way too many breaches, and breaches caused by the kind of, uh, of, of failures that Dr. Spafford is talking about, failure to patch known vulnerabilities. Uh, in the Ceridian case, the vulnerability there was well known to the company, there were free patches available, and the company quickly acknowledged that it had just sort of not been, uh, been asleep at the switch. We, uh, we had our legislation, uh, federal preemption. We worked out the language. Jan Schakowsky was the, the ranking member, and uh, so it was bipartisan. Do you think the bill, how would you change that bill uh, from the 109th Congress coming out of this subcommittee? What is it? Would you have a federal preemption again in the bill, and would you also change it in any dramatic way? Well, um, let me say two things. One is the commission is generally supported floor preemption. That okay. is, the federal standard should be the floor, states should be free 
if they saw fit to provide. Because right now in the 46 states, a company like Sony could be sued in 46 states. That, that would be true, uh, I think, uh, regardless. Uh, okay. But I, I would also point out that the civil cases involving security breaches have not fared particularly well. Oh, okay. Uh, um, okay. But, but in terms of uh, the, the bill that uh, emerged last year, we were generally supportive, but we would prefer, as Mr. Brookman has suggested, to expand the definition of harm. One concern was that the definition of harm referred to financial loss or other unlawful acts. It would not have covered geolocation data, information about health status, uh, or, for example, uh, information about children. And we think that the concept of harm needs to be broadened to reflect the kinds of breaches that we've seen and the kinds of concerns that we think are broadly shared. One of the things that, that I was struggling with is, so a corporation sets up a data security officer to do that. How do you make sure that that data security officer is complying? And is there a frequent way that you could do it? And I thought through the free market, you could have something like accounting firms that would just on their own develop to say, we'll come in and do private audits. But the question is, how much should the government get involved to make sure that that data security officer is actually complying with Federal Trade Commission requirements? Because everybody will say, the janitor could be the national security officer, the elevator operator, bingo, we're all done. But how do we as legislators and you as the, uh, the jurisdiction ensure that that is actually happening? Well, w w I mean, your audit illustration is a good one. When we put companies under water, we require them to develop a very detailed privacy policy to appoint a responsible official, which we hope has the credentials of a Dr. Spafford and not a janitor, and we have outside firms that are qualified to do this audit every two years to make sure the company is living up to its, pro to its promise. And as a, an enforcement tool, if there's a chief privacy officer who's required to ensure the plan is being implemented, if there's another breach, I suspect that not only would we sue the company, but we might sue the responsible official. In that case, it would be the chief privacy officer. Um, so there are ways of holding people accountable. One of the insights of the bill is you need somebody responsible within the company. Yeah. And we think that's very important. Uh, my time has expired, but uh, Madam Chair, if there's somebody else on the panel that would like to comment on my questions, is that possible? Is Mr. Martinez, uh, Dr. Spafford, or Mr. Brookman, any other? Uh, Mr. Stearns, we're going to have a second round. Oh, okay. It'll be fair to the uh, more junior members to allow that in the second round. So the chair recognizes Mr. Guthrie for five minutes. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you for being here today. And this is an important issue. And thank you, Madam Chairwoman, for holding this. And this is really to both Mr. Vladek and um, Mr. Martinez. It, it, the core of the problem is that typically improperly secured information from these, from people who are holding the data, or is it the criminal networks that are step, just a step ahead? They figure it out. They're, <clears throat> somebody can be vigilant in what they're doing, and somebody just figures out a way around their system. I and mean, what, what are you seeing? Is it just sloppy corporate side or data holders or is it the other I know it's probably a combination of both what do you see the it, most it, it's yes sir it actually is a combination of both I will though uh, just real quickly go through some of the uh, statistics on this recent uh, study that we did with Verizon B business 92% uh, of the attacks were not highly difficult and 96% of the breaches were avoidable through simple or intermediate controls and I think our panel members here have told you have brought up a lot of recommendations. So it's, it's a lot of times it's that some of these security measures that should be in place just aren't fully implemented. Um, and uh, although we do have uh, uh, criminals that are highly sophisticated and we have seen the, um, the amount of attacks due to hacking increase, um, a lot of these attacks though could have been avoidable had just best practices been applied. So you're saying that 96% were, I don't know, was essentially could have been avoided if it had been reasonable and rigorous. Correct. Yeah, that shows. Isn't the same that you're seeing at the FTC? I don't know whether I'd quantify it that way, but many of the uh, breaches we see are due to laxity or just um, foolishness. For example, we've sued both Rite Aid and CVS for taking patient and employee records and throwing them into unsecured dumpsters. Mm -hmm. You don't need to be a smart criminal to go dumpster diving. Um, 
Uh, we've seen also sophisticated hacks of the kind that I think Mr. Martinez is talking about. And in those cases, we do an investigation, but we don't pursue civil, uh, civil enforcement because, you know, we don't want to be playing gotcha. This is not a strict liability regime. I guess the question is if you have a standard of reasonable and rigorous and there's somebody always trying to get us getting a step ahead through technology, then you always have to update your reasonable and rigorous. But it sounds like you could eliminate over 90 percent of what the problems we've had just by having a, re a reasonable policy in place. I guess you're saying it's being stored. Obviously, throwing stuff in the dumpster is not reasonable. Right. So that that's you're seeing clear differences. But, but also not putting not applying the patches that the company is sending you mm -hmm. to fix a known vulnerability. In our view, that's not any different than leaving the door of the vault right open. But the FTC, uh, and, and you're doing consumer education, I know it's part of this, but this is a little outside of this a little bit, but it, within the realm of what we're talking about. The other day I got a phone call, this is your bank, you've had a problem with your account, give us your account number or whatever, of course I hung up. Right. But, are, are you, but a lot of people don't, and this gets what Mr. Schakowsky right. was talking about, and particularly I can see somebody that I know elderly that would that would oh I got to fix my bank account and all of a sudden they're jumping. Are are you focusing on that area? What do you guys? Is that your area? And are you what are you doing with it? Yes and yes. This is <laughs> you know we're principally in the anti fraud agency and that's the kind of classic fraud that we we are fighting every day. Um, and there are an awful lot of people who have have taken advantage of the economic downturn. People are more vulnerable to fraud when they're in financial jeopardy. And their fraudsters are out in force taking advantage of the most vulnerable. And that's what we spend a lot of our time on. And the final question I have, then, if I have a few seconds left, I'll go back to, to Mr. Stearns. But, Mr. Dr. Spafford, you know, you're talking about, the, in your testimony, the cost of the breach. Are, are, and and your, I guess my question is, in, as a business, if the cost is going to be so expensive, why wouldn't I invest up front? Or is, is the problem is the cost are on the business or up front, but the cost of the breach is spread out at like societal? Is that is that the issue that when you said $214 per breach, that's not borne by the company? Is this by society? I think you said 214 I didn't write it down. The, the cost uh, was a result of a study that was done, um, and that cost was per record, $214 per record. But cost uh, on the company that, that allowed <laughs> the breach to happen? Yes, to the company. And that cost was cost of notification cost of cleanup, cost of outside auditors, legal costs. So are businesses just not aware of these costs? That's why they're not, I mean, it seems like if I was a business and that was my liability, I mean, I'm wondering that's why correct. they're not going into the, the, that that's, direction. That's correct. Uh, the businesses don't realize what it's going to cost or them. Or they have a known cost here and hopefully not another cost that way. That's correct. If Mr. Stern, if you, I don't know if you got, I don't want to leave you enough time. I don't think. Thank the gentleman for his courtesy. I'll, I'll just wait enough. for the second round. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. That's correct. I appreciate that, gentlemen. <laughs> and the chair recognizes Mr. McKinley for five minutes. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I'm, I'm uh, curious about this whole issue because I've, I've not been a victim that I know of. Have any of you four been victim of a breach? Yes. 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 All four. All four of you. Um, How, how, how does the company know that it's been breached? The lights to go on? Is it, wait, uh, I had a practice, I had a real light before I came to Washington. Uh, and um, we, we had a, a firm that with 100 employees. Um, uh, would our IT person have seen a breach? Would he have seen something flashing on the, how we know we were, we were breached? You all keep talking about these larger companies what about the well, real America, the small businesses? I, um, so I, I uh, before I took this job, I worked for the New York Attorney General's office. And, I'm sorry? Uh, I, I, before I, I, I joined CDT, I worked for the New York Attorney General's office, uh, and, I, and I worked in the Internet Bureau, and, and um, in conjunction with the consum uh, Consumer Fraud Bureau, we would get these breach notifications from companies, smaller companies, who said, oops, we lost a lot of data. Um, in, in our experience, a, a lot of it uh, was we lost a computer. Um, I, 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 maybe even half was like uh, someone – put their computer in their car. And this is, this is like not just small companies, too. This is the, how the, the Veterans Affairs famous breach happened. Someone just put a lot of data in the laptop, left it in the back seat of their car, the window opened, and someone took it, right? Um, and, and, they, and they don't know. I mean, there's a very strong chance in that scenario uh, the person wouldn't look for the file and know what to do. But the fact of the matter is you have a large number of consumer records 
or gone now with someone who does have access to it and you don't know how they're being used. Okay, so, yes, Dr. Uh, another possibility is that uh, someone comes in in the morning and they discover in the record on their system that it has been accessed from an account in Eastern Europe or China or South Africa and that person has downloaded megabytes worth of information off the system including the entire customer database and that's certainly not someone who has legitimate access to the system how would you know that they've a they've access they uh, because because there's a record of it there's an audit trail there's of all that in information your computer that is automatic every small company would have that not every company but some would and, and so there's a record th and the company if they've turned on that record or it's possible that uh, a business partner or someone else would say we found a copy of your entire uh, uh, customer record on our machine and uh, how did it get here? Somebody must have left it here. And, and so the, okay. you often so discover this because it got out and somebody found a copy of it. Okay, I'm still not clear on that. I, I, I'm going to have to live with this a little longer, maybe ask more questions about it over time because I, I still think is uh, what I've heard were a lot of larger firms, a lot more records, but smaller firms are, are um, yeah, I'm trying to understand what they're going for because I've never, not that I know of, knock on wood, uh, I've never been, I've been breached, so I don't know what they're looking for. Uh, and I don't know with our former firm what, what type of security we have for that. But what, I think it was, uh, uh, at the end you said something about uh, if you've been breached and the notification that the, the consumer is to take appropriate action. What's appropriate action? It, it's happened. It's a, are they supposed to get a new credit card? Or are they get? What, what are they supposed? What is appropriate action for that little lady, a uh, seventy-year-old lady on Main Street? What if someone notify her, notifies her? What action is she supposed to take? Do they tell her? Well, I think generally the breach notifications do tell her what action to take. Um, and y y our website and others provide that basic yeah, information. No, but, well, but the, the breach notification should tell her what action to take. And so if someone has hacked email addresses, uh, she'll be alerted that she may get these emails from her bank asking uh, her to provide account information. These are phishing attacks. I don't think they'd be described in those technical terms. But I think she'd be warned uh, if there was credit card information, she may be told to, uh, to, to look at her account information, to uh, engage in credit monitoring, or they may, the, the company might provide credit monitoring for her. There are steps people can take to minimize the risk of loss. And one, one point of data notification, a breach notification, is to provide individual notice to every consumer about what the appropriate steps that consumer should take, to, should take to protect his or her interests. Thank you. I just, uh, whatever this bill comes out, I hope that there are some ways that it get down to the grassroots level how we can deal with this. Thank you. I thank the gentleman in round two. Um, I recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, Dr. Spafford, you re you, your testimony supports legislation that would apply to all entities that collect uh, personal information, including the government. Uh, do you think the government is ahead, equal, or behind the private sector in data security practices? And what about universities and nonprofits also in that regard? I think there, <clears throat> I think the government and many nonprofits have good security in some places and very poor security in others. Um, I have uh, testified at uh, hearings in previous years for losses of information at the Veterans uh, Affairs. Um, uh, there was an occasion there where it was just mentioned, uh, laptops being lost. Uh, there have been occasions where uh, databases have been breached even in the military and uh, information taken. Um, there have also a number of cases where the systems are very well protected. Uh, at universities, some are very well protected, some are wide open, and student records are regularly disclosed. Um, charities, businesses, uh, it's across the board. Some are very good, some unfortunately are not. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Brookman, as, as, you all, as the subcommittee knows, we uh, submitted a letter to Sony and we have the responses uh, as of late last night and uh, I looked at them th this morning to share something with you that they do have uh, in their letter to us. We asked them about uh, new security measures. They responded uh, that they're 
implementing new security measures that include they've added automated software monitoring and configuration management to help defend against new attacks. They have enhanced levels of data protection and encryption. They've enhanced ability to detect software intrusions within the network, sort of what Mr. McKinley was asking. And they've um, also included in that unauthorized access and unusual activity patterns. But if these are just a few of the new safety precautions, my question is, uh, given how many consumer records were at risk, why aren't these measures in place before? Uh, I think it's an excellent question. And as I said in my testimony, I, it, it, it boggles the mind that they're, that, that they're leaving open access to this uh, 2007 database of, of credit card information that, that apparently uh, they, they weren't even using. It just happened to be a legacy system. Um, this is something the FCC said a, a lot of good things about, that a lot of times it's more expensive for consumers, uh, for a company to go and erase data than just to, hey, just leave it laying around. Um, we, we, talking to companies, have tried to get them to, to use privacy by design and security by design to, to build these concepts into products from, from, the, from the ground up. Um, but sadly, uh, in so many places, it's not someone's job to go around and delete legacy data. Uh, I, was, I was very interested in the, in the suggestion of, of Vice Chair Blackburn about the idea of an eraser button. I think it's a very strong idea uh, that you know, if I have a direct relationship with the company and if I want to unsubscribe, end my relationship, I should be able to del delete that data. I think it's a very strong idea. Um, and to the extent that recognizing uh, Ranking Member Butterfield's idea uh, that it's hard to, for, for Congress to say keep data for so long uh, because it really varies across industries, giving consumers the power to say, hey, uh, go ahead and delete that now, I think it's a very good idea. I, uh, Dr. Spafford, you were speaking of the vulnerability that was known to many, I guess via the blogosphere or somewhere. I'm assuming you're speaking about the San Diego facility, uh, uh, that some speculate there was a, a, a breach in, in uh, or, or st you know, they're saying that it was an AT&T service center in San Diego where there was a known vul vulnerability. Uh, but if there are known vulnerabilities, uh, what do we do as a policy that minimizes these, these sort of physical locations and vulnerabilities? And I think my question would be better directed to Mr. Martinez or Mr. Vladek about known uh, vulnerabilities in the system and our ability to protect those physical locations that have, again, known, known to the bad guys, but it seems that we're always sort of behind the bad guys and our limits to... Uh, to stop them from, from what they're doing. Yes, Madam Chair, like I stated earlier, a lot of times what we see when we do investigations, and again, this, this collaborative study that, we do, that we've conducted, what it shows is, is that 96% could have been avoidable through simple uh, intermediate controls, meaning if, if there was 100 servers that the company owned, they, they possibly patched 99 of them but forgot to patch that last one. And so that, th an instance like that could create the havoc that we see. So you're so. saying it's all corporate responsibility at that point? Correct. What I'm saying is no matter the size of the company or who it is, you really have to be diligent in your systems. It's not just about being compliant for that moment. Is you have to maintain that, that, that diligence and, ma and monitor your systems on a constant basis. Thank you. And, and Mr. Vladek, with the, my remaining um, really? 25 seconds, uh, I think it's important you spoke to the concept of harm, and I think that's critical. And I think people don't understand what it means to have been hacked or have your personal information stolen until it's happened. You mentioned uh, geolocation, your kids and health records. Can you speak a little bit more about the, the vulnerabilities beyond somebody might just buy something on my credit card? I think people need to understand well, what, what, the, oh, sorry. what the crimes could be. Well, I don't know if these be crimes, and, and that's why we're, we're concerned about the definition that was in 2221. Uh, it said uh, uh, one harm was other unlawful action. But for example, Eli Lilly, in one of the first cases we did, sent out an email blast which associated particular patients with Prozac. Um, now, that is a reputational harm that I think most people would like to avoid. I don't know whether Eli Lilly committed a crime, but people ought to be notified in those kinds of circumstances. It just struck us in CVS and Rite Aid, they were dumping prescription records in dumpsters. People ought to know when that happens, even if the act of dumping them is not a crime. Geolocation data could be used for stalking, it could be used for other, uh, other purposes. Uh, and so w when the, when the uh, committee re-examines this legislation, we urge that it take a somewhat broader view of what constitutes harm in this area. Thank you. Uh, okay, the chair recognizes Mr. Butterfield for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, technology evolves rapidly, and what is cutting-edge technology today is obsolete tomorrow. Uh, the Sony press releases have stated that consumers' credit card information was encrypted. Uh, in addition, Sony stated yesterday in the Hill newspaper that passwords were protected using a hash function and described as a shortened version of full encryption. The data breach provision in the bill that we passed last year 
established a presumption that no reasonable risk of harm exists following a breach if the data is encrypted. Uh, Dr. Spafford, do you agree or disagree with that? Sir, I uh, disagree because it is possible that uh, disclosure could also include the password necessary to decrypt uh, those passwords. And that would mean that they could then be decrypted and read as well. Um, encryption all by itself is not a solution. It has to be uh, such that the uh, encrypted material can also not be read. Are there any technologies that you believe can be given such a presumption? Uh, certainly there are. Uh, there are some forms of encryption that could be uh, appropriately used if the key material is kept separate, for instance. Uh, but one has to look at the overall risk of whether or not the protected material uh, would be disclosed uh, if, that, uh, uh, if that material were uh, breached. And, of course, encryption, as you said, has its downside, but do, do you agree that it's still the gold standard? Um, some kinds are. Uh, some forms of encryption can be broken fairly, fairly uh, trivially. Um, encryption is uh, – uh, some forms of encryption are very good, and some are not. Uh, in um, uh, some previous versions of uh, – in some uh, – uh, previous versions of legislation that were introduced in this committee, uh, we have uh, sent letters about um, problems with encryption, and I'd be happy to provide copies of those to you um, later. Thank you. Special Agent Martinez, in your testimony, you describe a strong working relationship with the FBI, which you state works through the National Cyber Investigative Joint Task Force to lead the federal government's response to online national security threats. Now, I imagine that there is some fuzziness around cyber threats to businesses and that some of these could also be threats to national security. Uh, that's probably part of the reason there is a task force and why your agency is involved. I understand that businesses, not the government, own most of the network computer infrastructure. It is the private sector that controls and is responsible for vast swaths of the network for the financial system, power generation, and, and our electricity grid. Uh, given your experience in dealing with intrusions into private sector computing assets, is the private sector doing enough to guard the security and integrity of networked computers? I think there's always more that we can do, sir. I think um, from what you've seen today, from some of the uh, testimony today, and from some of the intrusions that we're actually discussing, there's still a lot more that needs to be done. And I think what's important is that the public sector needs to collaborate with the private sector in making sure that we, t that we improve our security. And would you extend that to the federal government? And, and yes, and I believe there's already steps that have been taken within the federal government to do that. All right. Uh, Special Agent, in your testimony, you also describe your relationship with the United States Computer Emergency Readiness Team. According to your testimony, that group defends against cyber intrusions on the .gov domain and shares information and collaborates with state and local governments and industry insofar as you participate in partnerships and information sharing with business. Can you please describe this relationship a bit more? Uh, yes, and, and I think it would be better explained by you as CERT, but um, they've taken the role of remediation and mitigation, so when there's an incident that occurs, um, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll encourage the private sector partners to reach out to U.S. search so that they can come up with a mitigation plan or best practices and so forth. And they've, uh, uh, in the last several, uh, I'd say in the last year or so, we've really improved our efforts uh, trying to do that, working with U.S. CERT and having them take the lead in remediation and mitigation efforts after an intrusion. All right. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. The chair recognizes Mr. Stearns for five minutes. Uh, thank you. Um, the demo from North Carolina makes a good point. Um, when you look across the federal government, it's almost sector by sector approach in dealing with the government. I know serving on the Veterans Affairs, we, there's lots of, there were breaches of huge a number of uh, veterans uh, when a computer uh, was taken home and uh, the information was breached. Um, the staff has pointed out that the f they, there are, for example, for the Veterans Affairs, they have the Veterans Affairs Information Security Act but that just applies to the Veterans Affairs. You have the uh, Federal Information Security Management Act, uh, which again is sector by sector, 
So, uh, you know, a thing that this committee would have to struggle with is also how to go about deciding what would apply to the federal government. Um, Mr. Valdek, do you think there should be a small business exemption for this? Because I heard from a lot of small businesses said, I don't want the overlay of a data security officer and, um, you know, how much is this going to cost me? It's more regulation. So the question is, is there a possibility that a small business of, let's say, less than 100 employees, less than 50 employees, there would be sort of a modified approach, or do you think the whole thing should apply to them too? Well, I think we need to separate out, separate out the various requirements of the legislation. We did not support a small business exemption from the uh, data security requirements. Right. We, we thought that uh, the, the that was the, crucial. That was crucial. Yeah. Uh, what we did support was rulemaking authority for the commission to determine when small businesses should be granted a waiver from the provisions relating to the payment for monitoring. Uh, credit reports following a breach. Okay. And I think that was the objection raised by small business at the time. And we favored some flexibility that would be uh, would, would be determined after a public rulemaking uh, and, and, and perhaps exemptions would be uh, would be authorized pursuant to that rulemaking. Uh, Dr. Spafford, um, there's some talk about uh, cloud computing being done here on the House and we no longer have our servers and our individual hard disk and so forth. Uh, if if uh, a company moves towards cloud computing storage, uh, is that safe or less safe, in your opinion, uh, keeping uh, the servers proprietary and protected? It depends on where the cloud storage is and how well it is uh, protected because you, what you have is uh, you're putting your records uh, on computing resources that are stored somewhere else and protected by someone else. Uh, if you have a private cloud, then that is within your corporate domain or within Congress here, protected here. But if you're using it outsourced, uh, you may not even know where it is and how it's protected. Uh, a concern that I mentioned in my testimony is that some cloud service providers may actually have their storage located outside the country. And uh, so if that storage is like the compromised, Philippines. we have a whole new set of problems because that storage is now outside the domain of the And United we don't States. really have reciprocity laws with countries outside, so it gets more difficult. It gets considerably more difficult. So if the, if the uh, information is breached, then where do people go to sue? Because it's outside. The, I guess you would still go to the holding company, the major corporation. Uh, 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 that's beyond my area of expertise, sir. Yeah. Mr. Brookman or Martinez or anyone else uh, want to comment on this cloud uh, computing? Uh, proprietary? Yes, sir. I'm just think of it uh, this way. Um, the, the crime scene now, like, like Dr. Spafford just said, the crime scene now does not become the, the server uh, farm located at a building. The crime scene now could be, part of it could be in the Philippines, part of it could be in Mexico, part of it could be in Los Angeles. And so it makes it much more difficult for law enforcement then to take action and obtain that information. Specifically, when we have to go overseas, now there's a whole other trigger of requirements or things we need to do, such as mutual legal assistance treaties. And the question then becomes, do we have treaties with countries where some of this information resides? Yeah. Mr. Brook, yeah, you so haven't changed. I, I would yeah. just say in response to that, that I think in, in many cases it may well be the case that a, a cloud computing servers would offer better privacy and security for, for you. Uh, especially in the case maybe of a small business that doesn't have the technical know-how of how to protect this data or, 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 or you know, what the, the le latest cutting-edge encryption techniques are. Uh, I think in that scenario, it may well make sense. You, there may be uh, not even marginal, significant uh, uh, security benefit from using a, a, a third-party service provider. On the other hand, I mean, in, in, the, in the recent news, I mean, Epsilon was a third-party service provider, right, whose job was knowing how to do mass marketing, and obviously it's not a fail-safe. Yeah. I just wanted to say that we have encountered this issue already in our enforcement uh, uh, efforts, and our position is that U.S. companies, when they're storing data involving U.S. citizens or U.S. transactions, they're responsible to us even if the data is stored in a cloud computer offshores. And, um, and we've made that quite clear. Um, we haven't tested it in the courts, but we're quite confident that we would we would be able to assert our authority in those kinds of instances. I think Mr. Martinez's concerns may be more complicated than ours. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank the gentleman. Uh, the chair recognizes Mr. Lance for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, good morning to uh, the panel. Um, Dr. Uh, Spafford, um, in its letter to the subcommittee, uh, 
Sony said that it acted with care and caution, and um, I'm wondering if, if that is the case, why wouldn't Sony notify consumers as soon as it shut down its network? Well, sir, I, I don't have f uh, full access to all the details of what was required for them to uh, gather the information as to what happened uh, to determine um, what individuals were involved and uh, what law enforcement needs were involved for them to gather evidence before uh, notifying people. Uh, certainly they uh, also were in a uh, state where they had to be sure that they had closed all of the vulnerabilities uh, before notifying individuals, I would assume. And so that, those, uh, uh, those factors probably introduced a lag into the notification. Uh, is there anyone else on the panel who, who might be willing to comment on that? I, I know this is speculative. Is there anybody else who would be interested in commenting on that? Uh, and uh, another area, Agent Martinez, in its letter, Sony also says that it believes it has identified how the breach occurred. Um, from your perspective and your, your expertise, why do law enforcement officials need a window of opportunity, so to speak, uh, to investigate a data breach before consumers are notified? Sir, I can't speak specifics to the Sony. I can tell you, based on our experience in previous cases, there could be times where through an, an operation that we are actually conducting, an active investigation, we actually are the ones who find the, the, uh, the, 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 the breach and report it to the, con uh, to the company. So in certain instances, we work with the company, and there's where, and a lot of states have enacted the uh, delay in notification for law enforcement purposes because what we don't want to have happen is that something that the company does could impact the investigation and then possibly um, um, uh, uh, hurt the investigation and not allow us to apprehend the individual. But what we always do is work with these companies, and in instances where we, we do need some form of delay of notification, we try to minimize that as much as possible so that the company can make the notification it needs. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, and um, Madam Chair, I yield back to the balance of my time uh, to, to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I think the gentleman I will graciously take you up on your two minute and 30 second offer and uh, ex understanding that Mr. Dingle is on his way down and I'd like to uh, ask questions until he gets here so he can participate. Uh, but I just want to say that this has been a very insightful hearing and uh, I, each member has brought up different, I think, complexities in understanding uh, how they see these problems. Uh, Ms. Shikowsky, when she specifically brought up the threat to seniors, I hadn't thought of that Sony PlayStation. We've all thought about perhaps a little bit younger generation and the risk to them. And uh, I just want to reiterate, although she's not here, that I, I will continue to work with her and explore the senior angle and, and with the FTC as well. And I want to thank and congratulate the members who have worked on this legislation previously. And certainly we've come a long way. 2005, I don't know that many people were talking about cloud computing, and yet we are today. So I think understanding briefly, the, cloud, you're, the FTC will have the authority to go out at servers that are based offshore. Uh, but do we also risk over-legislating and sending more offshore if we're not careful? And uh, I'll go to either the, Mr. Martinez or Mr. Vladek on that. I, frankly, I don't think this legislation is going to affect uh, cloud computing. I think that uh, companies are migrating to the cloud. I think s servers are, in, are inter-networked to the point where the physical location of the server is much less important than the kind of security it provides. Uh, and the legal regimes, I think, will adapt. So uh, we have not gotten pushback from companies that we've investigated where there was an issue about whether the data was physically within the United States territory or not. Um, in Ceridian, Ceridian's a global company. Um, and we ended up settling the case in a way that makes it crystal clear that its accounts for U.S. companies or for other companies that are employing people in the United States are covered regardless of where physically the computer may be, where the server may be. Thank you. Uh, briefly, um, I just had a great question, and I'm side dragged. Dr. Cassidy, do you have a question immediately for the panel? Chair recognizes Dr. Cassidy for five minutes. Uh, There's another committee hearing, so I apologize if somebody's already answered this. But um, let me start with Mr. Brookman. Mr. Brookman, I'm driving to my in-laws, there's a wreck, pop open my cell phone, and it tells me the congestion on the freeway. Oh, wow, this is pretty impressive. Then I read an article uh, showing how broad-minded I am on MSNBC's website. 
uh, about how this location data is apparently stored forever. I'm sitting there thinking, well, that's great. I can see where I am at any given time, and if there's a red zone up ahead and I need to get off on a side road. On the, what, on the other hand, why should whomever, Google or Apple, re keep this forever? What thoughts do you have? Yeah, uh, so there are, there are definitely wonderful secondary uses of, of location data that uh, Google and, and Skyhook and, and Apple all, all uses for. Uh, I think the Maps example is a great example. Um, there are ways to do it that are not privacy invasive. Um, they, can just, they, have to, they have to remember that it's me for a little bit because they have to see that it's my car stuck in the beltway moving five miles per hour. Um, but they can forget that after like an hour. And there, are, there are things they can do to, to not have to remember that it's me my entire life. Uh, I think the, the, the recent Apple story about storing uh, location information of up to a year residents on your phone uh, for, the, for what seems to be a marginal uh, performance improvement and to increase battery life, um, I think it's a great example of, of maybe not thinking through privacy by design as a concept from, from, from the beginning of this engineer thought, hey, it would be a great idea if you had all the, the cell towers that, that are nearby you um, stored in your phone, so you're, instead of checking back to Apple to say, hey, where am I? You can check your phone. Not really thinking, this is the kind of permanent log everywhere I've been in the last year uh, that I might not want someone like a, a hacker or someone to get their hands on. Um, I think a lot of companies have, have taken the idea of uh, location uh, permission seriously, so I, I'm, I'm glad that, that on Android and, and Google and Microsoft uh, and RIM phones, you know, they do ask, hey, is it, is it cool to use your permission, uh, use your location right now? Um, I still think they're working through <laughs> uh, some of the, the secondary usage issues. Um, because you can create really detailed logs about people uh, in ways that they would not expect. But I will say that as I, okay, now I'm a sensitive to it. Um, and I'm looking at my phone, and I'm logging onto a map, and there pops up that sort of, you know, click here after you've read, you know, 16,000 pages of legalese to proceed. But I, this time I actually read a little bit of it. And it turns out this was totally optional, and all I was doing was giving them per permission to store my data. Now, sure, it gives them the patina, the, the, the fig leaf of being careful about my data, but in reality, it was a trick. Uh, th I was thinking that this is, you know, I'm not going to, whatever, rip off their copyright, but indeed it was, no, we can sacrifice your privacy. So what kind of protections, put it this way, I'm just stumbling across this because I'm driving to Mobile, in Mobile, Alabama, uh, but I'm, I'm assuming the people on the commission have thought about this. What's the best way to address this? Well, there, there, there are two responses. One, for the purposes of data security, we've already discussed what we think would be an important amendment to the prior legislation, which is to talk about geolocation data, the disclosure of geolocation data as a result of a breach as a harm that would trigger the notification requirements. Because if your geolocation data where you've been for the last two years or whatever. Which, by the way, I'm not defensive of, just to be sure yeah, about that. <laughs> and no implication at all. Um, but you, you ought to be notified of that. Now, do we need legislation that says, thou shalt not keep this beyond X number of? Well, I, the commission is very concerned about geolocation data. We are engaged in, a, for example, a review of the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. And one question that we've asked is, how should we treat geolocation data? In our privacy report issued in December, we made clear that we view geolocation data as sensitive data that requires heightened protections. But my specific question is, should we have a rule or a law that says thou shalt not keep this beyond X number of days? Uh, the Commission has not taken a formal position on that uh, other than to underscore the sensitivity of that data. And we, you know, uh, we, I can't. And what I can't would be an argument against? Position. Because again, most folks, I was only aware of it um, because I stumbled across a website I don't normally read. Um, so why well, would I? And part of our concern, of course, is that the notice and consent in scare quotes that uh, that is extracted in the kind of uh, situation that you're talking about. Is not significant. Is, is not substantial. We we are worried about those. Things. So again, I guess what is the argument against that? That's my question. Is uh, there, I, I asking I, anybody? I think there would be two arguments. One is functionality. Uh, the the data is being uh, retained really to enhance the functionality. Although Mr. Brookman suggests that that is a short term functionality benefit. That that is correct. But but the I'm making the arguments on the okay. other side. Uh, not my arguments. The other, ar so the argument one is functionality. 
The other is it helps their analytics. They help to perfect the kind of services. Hey, precisely my point, huh? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you. Yeah. You asked that, uh, that, I, that I at least I rehearse the arguments that you'll hear, and those are the two basic arguments that you'll hear. I th one more, Mr. Brookman, to reply? Yes. So, I mean, I think there are, there are cases where it may be reasonable. I mean, I, I'm always scared about prescribing in law, like you must delete it after a certain period of time. But there are, are, are uses of data uh, where it might be reasonable for it to be tied to me for a specific period of time. Uh, you know, if, if I have a traffic program on my computer and, and, I, and I want my computer to remember where I, my, my phone to remember where I go to give me the, the optimized directions, that could be a, a legitimate use of my data. Um, people use these programs like Foursquare and Loops and Facebook places to check into places to kind of over maybe overshare, but you know, to create a very permanent log of all the places they've been. Um, people, some people like that. I, I think I've used a, a similar TripAdvisor feature on Facebook that says, "Hey, I've been to this place and that place, and I've checked in through my phone." Um, you know, I think it just depends on the usage. If you really do want to, you know, create a, "Hey, this is where I've been," um, just to tell the world, you know, I don't necessarily want to get in the way of that and tell people they can't do it. Okay, so so perhaps my, the solution is to be a little bit less tricky in terms of the. Um, do we have your permission? And so it's clear to record your data for in perpetuity um, by clicking here. I absolutely agree with that, that you should be very clear about the uses you're taking the data for. Uh, and, and before you share it to another person, uh, you should be very clear and get the permission for that as well. And, and not just buried on paragraph 40 of the terms of the service, right. up front in a clear and conspicuous way. And, and the FCC has done some great writing on, on you know, what that means. Okay, thank you. You're back. Thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes uh, Mr. Dingle for five minutes. Thank you for and commend you for holding this hearing. I particularly appreciate your courtesy in keeping the hearing open for me. Thank you. Uh, to all witnesses, this will be a yes or no answer, starting on your right and on my left. Uh, first of all, sir, do you believe the current industry efforts? with respect to ensuring data security are sufficient? Yes or no? Starting on, you're the one, sir. I'm the yes. one. Uh, I would say no. Uh, next witness? I would say no. Sir? No. Sir? No. Um, members of the panel, again, to all witnesses, can such efforts be improved, or do you believe that the Congress should pass comprehensive security legislation. First question is, can efforts be improved? And the second one is, should the Congress pass comprehensive security da uh, data security legislation? Uh, yes, as to both parts of the question. Sir? Yes to both. Sir? Yes to both. Sir? Yes to both, if the legislation is strong enough. Gentlemen, you're being very patient. We've got a lot to get across in very limited amounts of time, so your courtesy is particularly appreciated. Gentlemen, I understand that the comprehensive data security requirements do not at this time exist in the United States. Rather, there exists a patchwork of federal and state law and regulations that impose varying requirements on different people. Should federal data security uh, requirements supersede state requirements, uh, yes or no? Uh, I can't use a yes or no. Uh, yes, to the extent they're not as substantial as federal requirements, they should be at least the floor. Sir? Sir, I believe there should be a national standard for data breach reporting. Thank you. Sir? Without knowing what those standards are, sir, I can't answer. Sir? If they're strong enough and allow for state innovation, yes. Would I be fair in assuming, however, that the panel thinks that we need a lot of work to assure that we achieve the standards needed of, of a national character? Am I correct on that, sir? Y yes, sir. Sir? Yes, sir, I think there's been, a, there's been a lot of work for several years on, on multiple different types of data breach uh, legislation introduced in, in all different types of committees, and I believe the administration is real close to presenting to Congress a package that was worked on by multiple uh, executive agencies. Thank you. I believe I've given you a little more friendly question this time, sir. Yes. <laughs> sir? Yes. Uh, gentlemen, uh, this is always a question we run into. Further, in the light of federal fiscal constraints, should state attorneys general be allowed to enforce federal data security requirements? Yes or no? 
Yes. Sir? Can you repeat the question? Uh, should, should federal fiscal restraints uh, be able to be enforced by state attorneys general? I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about if I'm qualified to answer that I question. I will not press you on it, sir. Um, I'm not sure uh, if, if I'm qualified to answer that, but I think so. Sir? Absolutely. Uh, again, gentlemen, do you believe that the federal data security legislation should include the flexibility for the Federal Trade Commission to update requirements in order to keep pace with the advancements in threats to data security? Yes or no? Yes. Sir? Yes. Sir? Yes. Sir? Yes. Now, gentlemen, uh, this one to Mr. Vlader, uh, Vladek. Uh, do you believe the FTC's Magnuson Moss rulemaking procedures would stifle the Commission's ability to write rules that keep pace with technical advancements in threats to data security? Yes or no? Yes. Uh, again, Mr. Vladek. Um, if, uh, do you want to give a comment? Uh, do you believe that the FTC should be allowed to write data security regulations according to the Administrative Procedure Act? You'll understand that there's quite a difference between the two standards for rulemaking. Uh, yes, I do. And uh, yes, to the extent we're given rulemaking authority, we would ask strongly that it be conferred under the Administrative Procedure Act. Thank you. Now, to all witnesses, does the Federal Trade Commission currently have the resources with which to implement and enforce comprehensive data security requirements? Yes or no, Mr. Vladek, if you please. Uh, we always need more resources. If you please, sir. I would defer to the FTC about, uh, regarding their resources. A wise, a wise move, doctor. I do not know. If you please, sir. They could do it, but they could use more. Now, again, to all witnesses who have been demonstrating extraordinary patience here. Uh, if, uh, if you uh, felt no uh, in, that, in, in that case, what additional authorization would the FTC require to enforce such data security requirements? Uh, it would be perfectly appropriate if you were to submit this for the record uh, at some future, a future and comfortable time. Uh, Mr. Vladek. Um, we currently have uh, a relatively small staff working on privacy issues relative to other agencies, but it's, a, it's an important part of our mission, and we are a small uh, agency uh, which uh, would, would benefit greatly from having enhanced resources in this area. Uh, Mr. Martinez? I, again, sir, I would defer to the FTC since it is their... Uh, doctor? I, I would defer to the FTC. And our last witness? larger staff uh, penalty authority and definitely APA rulemaking would be fantastic. Gentlemen, you have been most patient. Madam Chairman, you've given me a minute and 34 seconds more than I'm entitled to. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank the gentleman. and I'm quite impressed with his ability to pack a wall up in five minutes with so many yeses and nos. Um, I ask unanimous consent to include the Sony and Epsilon correspondence in the record of this hearing. Without objection, so ordered. And uh, I just want to sum up by saying that prior to 2005, we didn't spend a whole lot of time as a nation talking about the dangers of data breaches. Well, things have sure changed in a hurry. We've gone from a stolen laptop containing 260,000 customer records to a sophisticated criminal cyber attack on a worldwide network containing more than 100 million customer records. And this begs the important question, if we don't do something soon, what's next and where does it end? So I'd like to remind members that they have 10 business days to submit questions for the record and ask the witnesses to please respond promptly to any questions they receive. Again, I thank our witnesses very much for your uh, help today, and the hearing is now adjourned. <laughs>